Uh, so as we, as we start this morning, let me just share uh, very briefly here that I'm going to try to do two things this morning. The first thing I'm going to attempt to do is do a sort of a backstory to the Holy Spirit that will kind of bring us up to uh, kind of where we are today, and then look at one aspect of what the Holy Spirit is involved in today, one role that the Holy Spirit has, which is the Holy Spirit's role in salvation. So I'm going to try to do those two things in the few minutes that we have uh, together here. And then through the next four weeks, uh, different ones of us will be up front here presenting additional aspects of the Holy Spirit. And hopefully this can be very informative for all of us and and ultimately bring us into a closer relationship uh, with God. Uh, As you may know, God's nature is to reveal himself. God never meant to be hidden from us. He goes to great lengths to reveal himself to us, primarily through his word, but through other means as well. This is God's story here. And so anytime we spend time in this book, we are learning to get to know God better. In his word, God chooses to reveal himself as what we call a trinity, not three gods by any means. No, God is one, but God presents himself, he manifests himself to us in three different ways. And we're all familiar with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And it is a mystery, okay? This is, this is something divine. Um, it is something we try to define in human terms, and we always fall short. So don't get frustrated if you ever can't think of this perfect example or this perfect word picture of what the Trinity is. There is an element of mystery there. But in the Scripture, God reveals Himself to us first as Father, God the Father. We see that primarily in the Old Testament. God presents Himself to us as, as a parent, as a good parent. We have one of our worship songs here at Metro, and we say, you're a good, good father. We, we didn't all have good earthly fathers. Some of us had earthly fathers that were either absent or maybe they were present but not, not healthy at all. God presents himself as an unfailing father, a father who loves us and his love for us never changes. He also presents himself to us in the Bible as creator, and he presents himself to us as very relational. From the very beginning, God designed his creation to be in relationship with him, and we see that with Adam and Eve in the garden. It didn't last long because our first parents rebelled against God, and that relationship was broken. We've been suffering under that broken relationship ever since. God the Son, the second member of the Trinity, uh, presents himself to us in the Bible as incarnate. This is God in the flesh. God takes on human form, comes to earth in the form of this person, Jesus Christ, lives his life in front of us here on this earth as an example to us. And and this is clearly unique, very different from God the Father in the Old Testament. Uh, We see Jesus as the Savior, as our brother, and as our friend, as the Bible presents him to us. And then the third person of the the Trinity is, of course, the Holy Spirit, who we're going to focus on. And uh, he is presented to us as our companion, as our instructor, as our comforter, and as our guide. Now, I don't know about you, but I have tended to live the majority of my life as being very okay with God the Father and God the Son. I sort of get that. Old Testament, God the Father leading his people, Jesus Christ in the Gospels in the New Testament. He comes to this earth, human being. I can relate to that. But then when it comes to the Holy Spirit, I've always started to struggle. It's like I don't really know what to do with the Holy Spirit, and I think a lot of us are, are that way. And let me just say straight up with you this morning, that's a problem. That that is a problem. And you're going to see why as we start to look at the Holy Spirit this morning. But let me just give you one thing that it helps me. I consider the Holy Spirit to be kind of like oxygen. Think about that for a minute. What, what What if we lost our source of oxygen? Medical people will tell us we have about three minutes and we're done. We'll expire without oxygen. But how much do we think about oxygen? How much do you pay attention to oxygen? You know, every breath you breathe, do you like think, oh, good, more oxygen. Oh, more oxygen. No, we don't. It's kind of out of sight, out of mind, but without it, we're dead. Without the Holy Spirit, we wouldn't be here today. 
There would be no church without the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, none of us would be in a relationship with God today. This is all by design. So, so the Holy Spirit really does play a very important role, and He's worthy of our attention. He's worthy of us trying to get to know Him better and figure out what does God the Holy Spirit have to do with us anyways. I'd like this morning for you to think in terms of a stage production. Think in terms of a, of a drama in three acts. And I'll call this drama God at Work, okay? Act one, the lead role is played by God the Father. This is the Old Testament of the Bible. And in the Old Testament, uh, God makes this rather dramatic entrance at one point in time. It's kind of an attention-getting entrance that God makes on the scene. I'm going to read a couple verses for you from uh, the book of Exodus. This is when the Israelites, God's people, have been in captivity in Egypt for 400-plus years. As slaves, they couldn't leave. They were suffering. And God has a conversation with this guy called Moses, who God has selected to help lead the Israelites out of Egypt. And here's what God says. Exodus 3, verse 7. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I'm concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land. Now, in those couple of verses, God reveals a lot about who He is. He starts off by saying, I have seen the misery of my people. God is not blind. God knows what's going on. God, God watches. He says, I, I've seen the suffering of my people, the misery of them. And He says, I've heard them crying out. Their cries are not lost on me. I, I, every time they're crying out because of the situation that they're in as slaves, I hear that. And then God goes one step further, and he says, I, I am moved to compassion. He says, I have concern for my people. But he doesn't end there. He says, so I'm going to do something about it. I see, I hear, I have compassion, and I'm going to take action. And the action that God says he's going to take and then takes is what we see in verse 8. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians. So God makes this grand entrance onto the stage of human history. And for the next 40 years, God the Father leads his people out of Egypt. He rescues them from their captivity, their slavery. He leads them on their journey to the land that he has prepared for them. He's, there's a visible manifestation of God's presence day and night. He provides them with food and protection. God the Father plays this lead role throughout the entire Old Testament. It's not all God does because he also introduces the person who's going to be playing the lead role in Act 2 of this drama. And Act 2 of the drama is the Gospels, the first four books in the New Testament. And the lead actor, of course, is Jesus Christ, God the Son. God introduces him several times in the Old Testament. I'm going to give one example here in Isaiah chapter 9, where the prophet Isaiah uh, is speaking the words of God. And here's what he says. He says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And we see in this verse there's something different. Child, son. God is going to come in the flesh in Act 2. God the Son, the lead player, is going to make his grand entrance as a human being. Now, the grand entrance that Jesus made was barely noticed by anybody, right? A small out-of-the-way town. He was born in a humble situation in a stable, and only a handful of people knew about it. But in retrospect, as we look back on history, we have to say that the birth of Jesus Christ is one of the most known and celebrated events in the world today. To this day, that's how grand an entrance Jesus made when he came as a human being. During his time on the earth, 
Jesus, God the Son, revealed about himself that his mission was to seek and to save the lost. He said that himself, and that's what he was about the whole time he was on earth, to seek and to save the lost. Now, that mission, fulfilling that mission, cost Jesus his life. He went to the cross. He gave his life up sacrificially for us to pay the debt that we owed that we couldn't pay, but this was the mission that Jesus came to accomplish. Now, while Jesus has the lead role in Act 2, he also knows that Act 2 is going to come to an end, and so he introduces the one who is going to have the leading role in the third act of this divine drama. Jesus, in John chapter 16, verse 7, is speaking to his closest followers, and he says this to them, but very truly, I tell you, it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the advocate, the Holy Spirit, will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. So as good as it was when Jesus was there with his small group of followers, as great a relationship as they had, Jesus said, something better is coming. And in very simple terms, when Jesus was on this earth, he could only be at one place at one time. He could only be having one conversation with an individual or a group of people, and Jesus says, this thing is going to explode. It's going to get so much bigger than what you guys have experienced, and the only way it's going to happen is for me to leave, for the Holy Spirit to come, and you guys go off in every direction with this message. He says, it's actually going to be better. So Jesus is introducing the Holy Spirit as the lead in Act 3 of this drama. Now, the Holy Spirit's entrance onto the stage uh, in Act 3 is, is, in my opinion, the most dramatic of the three. We saw God the Father, we saw God the Son, and now God the Holy Spirit shows up in Acts chapter 2. Um, Jesus has gone. He's returned to the Father. Uh, His followers are kind of left in limbo for a little while. Jesus is gone, but nothing has happened. Jesus told us to wait. Okay, we're waiting, and we're waiting, and we're waiting. It wasn't a long period, but they continued to gather together. They would pray or have a meal or whatever they did. And in one of those settings, here's what's happening. Here's what happens in Acts 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly... A sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. So so here's the setting. You've got this, this small group of people. It says they're in a house. They're doing whatever they're doing, and all of a sudden, a sound comes. It says... Luke, the writer, the the best he can do is to describe it, a sound like a rushing wind that came down from heaven. It wasn't a wind. It wasn't blowing all the stuff around the room, but it sounded like a rushing wind. And then it said that there were, he says, there were these tongues of fire, like flames of fire that came down onto them. It wasn't fire. It didn't burn them up. Their hair didn't catch on fire or anything like that, but that's what it looked like. And Luke is doing the best he can to describe these supernatural phenomenon that are going on. And then he goes on to say that several of them start to speak fluently in a language they had never learned. If you go on down in the passage, you find there's 15 different languages that needed to be spoken that day. And all of a sudden, these people who'd never studied these languages became fluent in these different languages languages. And Luke's conclusion then is is that these people just got filled with the Holy Spirit. They were just filled with the Holy Spirit. They've been followers of Jesus Christ during his time on earth. They've been faithful to him, acknowledge he's the son of God, and now it kind of completes the package. They have now become filled with the Holy Spirit. So this is a rather dramatic entrance that the Holy Spirit makes onto the stage here in Act 3. And that's where we're going to start today, looking at the Holy Spirit and this one aspect of what the Holy Spirit does, his role in salvation. We're going to stay right here in Acts 2, where we've we've been already, so we don't have to go much further away. And we're going to find that there's three unique aspects that the Holy Spirit has in the salvation process, okay? The salvation process, of course, most of us will know is, is, is what God does 
on our behalf to allow us to get back into a relationship with him. The relationship that was broken in the garden with our first parents, where sin separated us from God, now Jesus has, has taken care of things on the other end and brought us back into the relationship with God, or at least brought us in, into the potential of getting back into a relationship with God. And of course, we are saved when we receive the gift that God offers to us to get back into relationship with God. We'll be talking more about that here. I just want to point out this, that we're still living in the third act today. The third act has not ended yet. We are in the third act the Holy Spirit is the lead. We all, all are supporting cast members in Act 3 of this grand drama. So as we look at salvation, the three things where the Holy Spirit plays into it, number one is the proclamation of the gospel, the, 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 the sharing or speaking of the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Number two is the invitation response process, okay? Somebody can share the message, but... If there's no action, if it falls on deaf ears, nothing happens. But, but there's more that happens. The Holy Spirit is involved in an invitation and a response process, a response to the message. And finally, the actual rescue itself. The rescue happens. Acts chapter 2 is basically a microcosm of how the Holy Spirit works, how the Holy Spirit is still working to this day today. So let's look at the proclamation of the message first. Where does the Holy Spirit fit in the proclamation of the message? Uh, right before Jesus returned uh, to the Father and he was talking to his, his followers, and it's recorded for us in Acts 1 verse 8, he, he gives them this one sentence that's just packed with truth about what's about to happen. And Jesus says this. He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. Now, in this passage, Jesus tells them three things that he says are going to happen. He, he's not saying they might or it's optional. No, he says, you will get into a relationship with the Holy Spirit. You, you, you will, because I'm leaving, and this is what you're going to need now to go forward. You will get into a relationship with the Holy Spirit. Number two, he says you will receive power. When you get into a relationship with the Holy Spirit, the power of God is within you. He says you will receive power because he has a job for them to do that they could never do on their own. So they're going to need this Holy Spirit power, this power of God, to accomplish the job that God is giving them to do. And thirdly, he says you will be my global spokespersons. You're going to be the ones, he says, to take this message far beyond where you have ever lived before. Now, when I got to that place in the passage, I started thinking about what's, what's, how does that really look? How does that work? What Jesus is talking about this becoming global spokespersons, taking this message. And I was thinking about the guys that he was talking to there, and it was his 12 disciples. And one of those 12, you will remember, was the Apostle Thomas. Do you remember? He's the one that doubted whether Jesus had risen from the dead or not. When, when uh, some of, after the resurrection of Jesus, and some of the disciples had met with Jesus, Thomas wasn't there. And so the rest of them told Thomas, hey, we've seen the Lord, we've seen the Lord. And Thomas says, no, 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 no. I don't know what you guys were drinking, but I'm not going to believe that unless I see him with my own eyes and touch him with my own hands. And within the hour, Jesus shows up. And it's like, okay, Thomas, here I am. You wanted to see me. Go ahead, touch me. Let's have some food together. And Thomas goes, my Lord and my God. So this guy, Thomas, is one of the ones that's there when Jesus says, you're going to become my global spokespersons. Christian history tells us that Thomas took the gospel all the way to the country of India. You can go there today, and you can see the tomb where Thomas is buried. You will see churches that, that trace their roots back to Thomas going to India with the gospel in response to what Jesus said in Acts 1.8. So this is all going through my head, and all of a sudden it occurred to me that, that our own Pastor Ansi, our director, of spirit, our director of Student Ministries here, her maiden name was Thomas. Okay, she was Ansi Thomas, and she was born in India. 
So I sent her a text right away, and I said, girl, is this coincidence, or does this have anything to do with what we're talking about here? She sends me back this long text, and she says, no, it's not coincidence. She said, in my province of India where I was born, it's almost 20% Christian there. And Thomas is a very common name that people choose in, in, in that area. And, and the way it works there is you take your father's first name to become your last name. So her dad, his first name is Thomas. But she says it's a, it's a common name in that area because people trace their Christian heritage back to Thomas responding to what Jesus said here in Acts 1.8. Okay, Thomas went in the power of the Holy Spirit to proclaim the message that was given to him, and he literally took it to the ends of the earth the way Jesus said in Acts 1. I just thought that was kind of cool, that we've got that right in our own midst here, okay? So in Acts 2, we see now the promise that Jesus made playing out. In verse 4 that I just read to you in, in Acts chapter 2, when, when uh, Luke says they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, strange things were happening. People were talking in language they'd never spoken before. It gathered a crowd around them. People got interested. What's all this noise? What's going on? How come these people are speaking languages they've never learned? And we'll find out the crowd was actually more, more than a couple thousand people that gathered around there. And some of them said, those guys are drunk. Look at them. They're drunk. And so Peter jumps up at that point in time, and he quiets the crowd down, and he gives the most powerful speech he had ever given in his life up till this point. And the first thing he says is, you guys are mistaken. They are not drunk. It's 9 in the morning. Nobody gets drunk at 9 in the morning. What is happening to them is what God promised in the Old Testament, that this day would come when the Holy Spirit was going to make his appearance. And that's what you are seeing. Now, Peter proceeds to very boldly, in the power of the Holy Spirit, start speaking to these people in ways that could have got him killed, okay? He tells, he tells about the death of Jesus Christ, which they all know about. It just happened recently, and then he implicates the people in the crowd. He said, you guys, some of you guys caused the death of this guy, Jesus Christ, then he talks about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And there's people in the crowd there that had seen the resurrected Christ. And there's people that are nodding their heads. It's like, yeah, we saw him. We heard him. We hung out. It was, it was that recent that it happened. It was undeniable. Peter goes on to say, Jesus Christ has poured out the Holy Spirit on these people. That's what you are seeing. And oh, by the way, he says, God the Father has made this Jesus Christ both Lord and Messiah. Now, if you were here about three or four weeks ago when we were doing the Transformer series, and Pastor Peter preached one Sunday, and he was talking about Peter and Judas. Remember the subtitle of, of our series was Rogues and Heroes? And both Peter and Judas were rogues at one point in time. Peter this guy who's boldly preaching, risking his own life at this point in time to do so, he was the guy who denied Jesus three times. I don't know the guy. never heard of him. He's the guy who said to Jesus, I'll die with you before I ever deny you. He was the guy that caught and ran when things got tight and hid out. And then he completely disqualified himself from any ministry. What's happened to Peter? Simply this. He has been filled with the Holy Spirit. And now he's proclaiming the gospel message in the power of the Holy Spirit. The proclamation of the message of salvation happens through the power of the Holy Spirit. The second thing the Holy Spirit is involved in is the invitation response process. Okay, so Peter's given this message to the people, and now it's kind of on them. What's going what's to happen as a result of that? Look at this in uh, Acts 2, verse 39, where Peter is still speaking, and he says this, The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Call. What happens after the proclamation of the gospel happens is the Holy Spirit extends an invitation or a call to the people that are there. He, he's, he's inviting people to come and receive what has just been offered to them. 
The Holy Spirit is at the center of that invitation, at the center of that call. And then on the other side of that is the response of the people. Some, some were interested, some were disinterested. They didn't all respond positively. But in Acts 2.21, Peter says, And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So we have this call from the Holy Spirit to the people, and then we have this response, which he also calls a call, where the people are calling out on the name of God for salvation. The response to the Holy Spirit's call. All of this is under the umbrella of the Holy Spirit who has showed up on the scene here. The proclamation, the invitation, the response of the people. And then finally we have the rescue, the actual rescue that takes place. Now, if you ever hear the word rescue, you need to think bad news. Because if there wasn't something bad, there wouldn't be a need for a rescue, right? If you drop a book, you don't have to get rescued. You lean down, you pick your book up. But if you're drowning in the sea and you've run out of strength and you're slipping beneath the waves and you see a guy in a boat and you say, please help me, save me, you need to be rescued because you can't rescue yourself. And the bad news here was separation from God, as I said earlier. These people were separated from God because of their sins. They needed to be rescued. They needed to be saved. And we read that Luke says, Peter's message cut them to the heart. That's how this message impacted him. It cut them to the heart, and they said to Peter, what should we do? And Peter's response to them is, repent. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the Holy Spirit. He says, why does he say repent? Because the people that he's talking to, there are very religious people, and they were counting on their religion to save them, and it wasn't going to work. They were counting on good works to save them, and it wasn't going to work. And Peter says, you've got to change. You've got to repent. You've got to turn away from that. You need to turn towards what God is offering to you through his son, Jesus Christ. Repent from that and be baptized. Go public with this. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. And what will happen? Forgiveness of your sins. And he says, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the rescue that God makes available that they need to reach out and respond to. Verse 41 of Acts 2 says, those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. This 3,000 church was not the people who were in the house. This is not the people who heard the wind and had the tongues come down and were filled with the Holy Spirit. No, those people were already in a relationship with Jesus, and then the Holy Spirit came upon them. This 3,000 were the outsiders. They were the curious ones. They were the ones that heard the noise and the commotion and came to see what it was all about. And now they didn't all respond, but at least 3,000 of them did respond to the Holy Spirit's message, invitation, motivation to respond, and they were saved that day. They were rescued. And finally, Acts 2, verse 47, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. The Holy Spirit now has set the stage for what is going to continue to happen over and over and over again in the third act of this drama. This is like I said before, this is where we are living today. Surrounded by people who need to hear a Holy Spirit-inspired message of the gospel, who need to hear and receive that invitation and respond to it, and the end result is being saved, being rescued. Um, several years ago, when I was in my former career as a pilot uh, flying around down in Venezuela, I got a radio call. And the call just said there's a, there's a medic, medevac flight that needs to be made from this certain village and bring patient out to the hospital. And this happened fairly routinely. Um, it was about a two-hour flight from that village to town. Uh, I wasn't too far away. I knew there was enough daylight that I could make it and get the patient out there. So I, I went over and I landed there. I was thinking it'd be a patient on a stretcher. This is fairly typical. Or maybe a, a mom with childbirth complications. This was typical as well. But instead, what I found was a small group of, 
of people had gathered there uh, by the, by the uh, airstrip. They were uh, Yanomami Indians, very, very primitive people. I knew they didn't live in this area. Um, I couldn't speak any of their language. Um, so through an interpreter, I found out that they, had, they came from a village way up in the mountains that was ravaged by malaria. And their village was slowly being decimated by malaria. And this, this group of people said, hey, if we stay here, we die. And so they loaded up into some dugout canoes, and they floated down the river, hoping to come to some place where there might be some kind of help for them. And that's how they got to this village where there was a radio. And I walked among them and found that there were five young mothers, teenage women. They marry very early in those places, and they each had an infant in their arms. And as I looked at the infants, I, I knew immediately what was going on here because the malaria hits the very old and the very young the hardest. The people in the middle who are young and you know, strong can, can make it, but, but infants and elderly people often succumb. And I looked at these five infants, and I knew that they were not days away from death. They were literally hours away from death because when their breathing is super shallow and their skin is just, just pallid and they're, they're listless, uh, you know they are very, very close to the end. So through the interpreter, I said to the, the folks that were there, look, I've got five seats in the airplane. There's five moms here with their five babies. Uh, there's no room for any husbands to go along. They're going to have to go by themselves into a plane, which they'd never been in a plane before, out to a town, they'd never been to a town before, ride in an ambulance, they had no idea what that was, and go to a hospital. All they knew was that there was hope at the other end. There was, there was the promise of some help to save their kids. So they talked among themselves, and I started seeing the heads nodding and the husbands, you know, encouraging them, and they all five decided to go. So I got them in the airplane, put the seatbelts on the moms, held the babies, took off, and started towards town. And as I was flying, I realized that this was kind of a picture of, of, of what the Holy Spirit presents to us in a spiritual sense. It wasn't like these folks had four or five different airplanes to choose between. And you can take any one you want. They're all taking you to town. Or they couldn't go to the river and get on a fast boat that would take them to town in time to save their kids. There was one airplane. There was one way to get to town. There were just enough seats for the five moms. And they just had to make a decision whether they were going to accept that invitation or not. And in the end, it was the only hope they had for the rescue of their children. And they all chose to do it. That's the situation that the Holy Spirit comes into in the third act here. People who are desperate, people who have tried their own way and can't get back into a relationship with God. They've tried to be good. They've tried to be religious. It hasn't worked. The Holy Spirit presents an option, one option, but it's a good option, and it's an option that's big enough for all of us. If you're here today and you call yourself a Christian, you identify yourself as a Christian, that by faith in Jesus Christ, you're in a relationship with God. I think I can say without doubt that at some point you heard a Holy Spirit-powered presentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and that the Holy Spirit gave some kind of an invitation to you, a call, and that you responded to it. And, and were saved. You were rescued. I can say that with confidence because that's what God has revealed to us in his word. This is his strategy. This is his plan. This is what he provides for us. And if you identify yourself as a Christian today, I believe you have experienced the very thing that the folks experienced in Acts chapter 2. If you're here today and you don't identify yourself as a Christian, I'm really glad you're here. I think you're at the right place. I would say you probably at some point have heard a Holy Spirit-inspired proclamation of the gospel. And you may even have been the recipient of a call or an invitation from the Holy Spirit, but up until now, you have said, no, thank you. I'm good. I'm okay. I got this figured out. I don't necessarily need that. Let me just leave you with this thought. The Holy Spirit is both very patient, but the Holy Spirit is also relentless in his pursuit of us. 
And just because he spoke to you once doesn't mean he won't speak to you again. But you also need to remind yourself that none of us have a guarantee of tomorrow. None of us. I don't care how young and strong you are. None of us have a guarantee of tomorrow. So when the Holy Spirit presents the gospel message to you, when it is offered to you and it extends you an invitation, I would encourage you to take it very seriously. This is the opportunity that God has provided for each and every one of us to get back into a right relationship with him. Let me lead us in prayer.